with the Oklahoma State University Library, and we're here in Lawton, Oklahoma, at the at Ben Allison Farm, or just Allison Farm, with with Ben and Greg Allison. Uh, and this is in regards to our Centennial Farm Family Project, and thank you for having us today. You're welcome. Let's start by having you tell us what you know about how your family came to have this particular piece of land. My grandfather and grandmother Allison uh, come to Lawton from Pleasanton, Texas. And he registered for the lottery. I'm not sure the exact time frame on that, but he did register for the lottery. And then uh, I don't know whether he stayed here for the lottery or he went back home. But anyway, he made several trips from Pleasanton, Texas to Lawton, Oklahoma, and the moving and so on. And then eventually the whole family ended up here. And his first name was? Kelsey. Kelsey. K-E-L-S-E-Y, or do we know? Do we know I think that's probably pretty close, okay. K-E-L-S-E-Y. Well, do you know about how far that is from Pleasant, Pleasant to here? Uh, we, we, we can look. No, I would, you know, from here to San Antonio, a normal drive is about eight hours in a vehicle in today's driving. So in a covered wagon, you know, their first time, I would presume He's it would, it would take probably five days, maybe. Uh, uh, he, Dad has told me stories that he's always heard. I guess probably when they did win the, the lotto ticket on the place that um, when they come up in the covered wagon uh, with their belongings and one cow. I'm not sure of that. Yeah. Well, you some, go ahead and tell life, a story about the calf. Well, some livestock anyway. But I'm sure he was by himself this particular trip. And he was leading a cow. And she had a young calf. Now, I don't think on the way that the calf was young when he left. And he got to a point and people began to run out in the street when he went through a little town, waving for him, stop, stop, stop. Well, he didn't for a while, but he finally stopped. And people ran out there and said, you're, you're dragging your calf, you're killing your calf. And he said, no, he was, he's all right, and went on. Well, I guess probably some of them got on horses and run him down, and little calf was just walking along there for easy please. And he, he loved telling that story. <laughs> They would, I guess, the calf would be drugged so far until it realized it would have to yeah, get up and follow. Yeah, it wasn't hurting him. Uh, so he wasn't moving very fast at all. But didn't you always tell me and Cindy that uh, your dad, which would be my grandfather, was about five years old? When six, he, I think. Five or six whenever they he come He on the place down here first. So your grandfather was already married at that time? Yeah. Yeah, that's what they knew. No. Yeah, the Kelsey. Yeah, yeah, Kelsey was, yeah. Now, their their oldest son come up with him at some point and stayed. I guess probably after the lottery, they had to someone stay on the farm right then or immediately after. And he stayed there, and I think in the meantime, before they all got settled, he had married a neighbor lady from on down the road there. His name was Hugh. Allison and his descendants live on the quarter right north of us here. It is not a, it's not the Centennial Farm. Uh, uh, how many acres did was the initial? 160. 160. And is it still all intact today? Yes. And it's still intact and still farmed. What do you know? And Allison. Right. Well, what did the first ones farm? What was their their product and produce? You mean my grandpa? And, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not real sure, but I think probably some corn and uh, cotton. Seemed like this was a pretty big cotton country at one time, real early. And I don't know whether that's just what they had been used to planting where they lived or 
what? But they had a living. Uh, sometimes I wonder how in the world they done it. But. And how many children did, did they have? Chelsea. Let's see, there was uh, three boys and I guess three girls. Don't look at me. <laughs> Well, or, well, I'm just trying to. Yeah, there was there was at least six of them. Trying to figure out then then how did how did you how did it pass down? Okay, and uh, I think the year was approximately 1926 or seven, along in that time period. Uh, my grandparents apparently wanted to move to town, more conveniences and so on. There was no water on that place at all, and of course no electricity. So they was elderly, getting elderly, and they wanted to have a little more conveniences. So my folks, I guess all along, had wanted to buy it when they wanted to get rid of it. So they uh, managed to buy it along in that time frame. And they was the ones that built the part of the house that's down there now in 1912. Well, I said 26, where'd that come from? I don't know. Okay, maybe my maybe my grandparents did build the first part of that house. I know they built the clapboard house first and then lived in it from I guess nineteen one or two up to the nineteen twelve. But then from nineteen twelve I guess they lived there until I'm pretty sure it was about 26. Okay, it, it was just a, what, a two room? Yeah, four little rooms. Four little rooms with a basement? Yeah. And the kitchen was in the basement. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, and the, uh, it still has the basement. Dirt floor. That's the main thing that's wrong with the house was that basement under it. It's settled and leaked water. And it's it always been kind of a mess. Well, it's interesting that the kitchen was in the basement, though. <laughs> I can't imagine. No, I don't wonder what they're thinking. Uh, about. Heating. It, it's part of it still. It's got a, a bricked, well, that was probably right. far pit. No, they uh, they just it's brick. It was just uh, that was just a column. Yeah, to hold a chimney. That well, chimney okay, but you know. The lower you build your heat, as it rises, it will room, uh, warm the rest of the room. Well, it doesn't that, but there was never, as far as I know, a place to build a fire in the okay, in the fireplace down there. What well, did they uh, have a large garden? Yes. Did a lot of canning. Ah, uh, yes, and also there was in the stipulations of of the homestead that each homestead had to plant so many trees, fruit trees, orchard. I say fruit trees, it may have been nuts, I don't know for sure. But there was a there's one tree still left down here in that original orchard. But it's I think it may be dead after last summer. I mean we could have saved it but you could see through it. It was I'm surprised the wind hadn't blown it over. It's probably been hit with lightning too many times because the trunk is hollow. Uh, but it's it was still, I think it's still alive. There, uh, it's a peach tree, right? Oh, pear. Pear. They're very durable trees. Uh, but then the same thing, and I don't quite understand that because this was never a homestead. This is school land right here. And back to the west here, about a quarter of a mile. There was a house and a barn, and there was an orchard there. And I remember it was uh, mostly fruit trees. I'm sure they were pear because pears are pretty hardy, and they, I don't think it would survive here without much water. But I can remember picking up pears that fall off of the trees. There's probably about three of them there when I can remember, but I dug up the last one there about 20 years ago. <laughs> was in the way. It didn't make any fruit in when. Well, you said there wasn't any water. What, what's their water source? The, 
barrels and go to the creek or something. Catch it. Now here, there was a artesian well a mile north and two miles east. And after they got, well, even they used to haul. I can remember seeing wagons and teams with wagons and barrels there at that well, but it flowed. It was a flowing artesian well. And they just sat there with open pipe flowing year round. And you just drove in there, and I don't know how they drove their horses through it, but they drive in there through it, fill up their barrels with whatever they had, and leave. I can remember one morning, went with my dad in a 35 Ford pickup, and he had a tank that fit in the back about right on some skids, and he'd loaded it up. He could load it by himself. It was a pretty light gauge metal and go over there and get water. And we went over there one time and it was icy. And then where they pulled under the uh, spigot or the spout, downspout to fill, they had piled rock and concrete and so on in there to keep them getting stuck. And of course, so that ice froze on them rock and so on as slick as it could be. And I can remember my dad got up in there where he needed to be and Filled the tank full. We'd had to sit in line probably close to an hour to get water. And when he went to pull out, it spun, and he probably backed up and gave a little run. Tank went out the back of the pickup, dumped the water. So we had to put the tank back in the pickup and go around to the end of the line and start over. But then we finally, uh, after we got electricity, they knew of some wet spots over here in the pasture, a spring. We dug out one, or they did, dug out one spring, and it didn't furnish much water at all, enough to drink and uh, flush the stool if you didn't do it too often. That was right after we got electricity, and I think that was probably in about 47 or 8, first electricity that was on that place. So we piped water to the house, and then later, it seen it wasn't going to furnish enough. We went down a little farther down on the creek and dug out a well, and it was a real good well. But it had the old steel oil field casing for, for a casing, oil field pipe for a casing. And then the preparations rusted shut and shut it off. So we drilled another one there pretty close to it. Same thing there, we had good water there for eight or 10 years, maybe a little longer than that. He was on the fourth one now, but we put PVC casing in it and it won't do that. So it's, it's good well. It's been there, I remember, I was still in high school or right out of high school in that I graduated in 80. I'm thinking I was still in school when they dug it, so it's, 30 plus years old, and through all the droughty weather we've had, it has never went dry. And I kept all, tried to keep all of our trees alive with it this last summer. Um, that takes quite a bit of water. But back to, how long has a cistern been across the road? I don't have no idea there. Okay, that it was hand dug. And it had to be soon after they built that. And it, it is brick lined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the north side of the house, there's a cistern. That's where they stored their water. As they are, uh, rain water off from the house would flow into it. Uh, and then, uh, before y'all got electricity, y'all had gas lights. Yes. Uh, I don't remember what the gas company's name was. Consolidated or I'm not even sure. They come through from a gas field. You know where Hewland is? Probably not. It's over here on Highway 65. About uh, Hewland is six miles south. And then this gas field was another four or five miles south of there. But there was a lot of gas there at that time. Lawton didn't have gas. So they piped gas from there into Lawton. And the main come through that quarter there and um, 
they got free gas, period. And they had gas lights, which was plenty good to read the newspaper by or whatever. Uh, had water heaters if you had water pressure and so on, you know, running water. But they, after a period of years, I'm not sure how many, probably 15, 20 years, we got notices that they was going to have to start charging some. And I can understand why, because people would get a leak in their service line from the meter to the house. Well, I guess there wasn't any meters. And anyway, they was wasting too much gas. So they thought, well, if we charge them for it, maybe they won't waste too much, which I'm sure was right. But it went up there two or three times, and I can remember when I was probably just out of high school or maybe still in senior or something in high school, got a letter that they'd went to a corporation commission and had declared all in contracts null and void. They would pay the same rate they do, I guess, in town. Well, did they get any money or income from it going through uh, through the land? I think that was part of the yeah. gas company's for free gas. Uh, you know, for the easement right away was to provide free gas to the landowners. We were afraid a time or two they got to having a lot of leaks on that main line. And everybody was scared they would probably do away with it because this gas field had run out of gas and was afraid they'd just do away with that line. Well, no, they had run the line from there to Temple. So they had to furnish Temple gas. So they brought gas in out of Lawton and sent it that way. And uh, it's it's still that way. Well, did you heat, heat with it? Was the house heat, heated with it? Oh, yeah. Had a big old, you can just call them circulating heaters, a big square heater. And it sat kind of in the central part of the house, and it would, it would warm the whole house, but it would warm this one big room. It was the main living room. It would warm it, and there was usually enough heat in the kitchen from the cooking and so on. And then the bedrooms, two of the bedrooms was just off of that room. And my mother always shut her door to her uh, bedroom because she didn't want any heat, none at all. And it would get cold in there. But the other two bedrooms, you could leave the door open and they would stay pretty warm. And were any of those downstairs or it was just no, the kitchen? The only thing downstairs was the kitchen? Well, that was at, at first. Oh. Um, probably have to back up here at some point. After my mother and dad bought the place, they added about the same dimensions that it was onto the east of it. And that was a kitchen and a bedroom and a, uh, you could call it a porch, but actually it was her butter room. I had mentioned that she made homemade country butter. They milked uh, anywhere from 12 to 28 cows. Or I'm going to say it's probably 50 years at least. She would get up every morning at about uh, somewhere between 4.30 and 5.30 and start getting her cream ready to churn. And uh, I sometimes it would wake me up, but usually didn't even bother me. And she would do her churning of the butter and molding of the butter and everything. And then she would wake my dad up and me and my sister to get up and eat breakfast and get ready for school. And I usually had quite a few chores to do. Uh, by that time I had some show pigs and so on that I had to get out and feed. She, that churn she had, it was a big old barrel, wasn't it? Yeah. In, the, in earlier life, was it before the electricity? How was it powered? By a gasoline motor. Was the motor outside or inside? No, it was inside there, about where the stool is now. Okay. It sat on a little platform there. And she had... A line shaft. Yeah. 
ran several things off of one motor. Uh, and he mentioned the butter mold. Uh, my sister has it. And she had uh, cartons. And we, I don't know if I can find them, but she had cartons printed up. And there was a one pound carton. And that helped subsidize. Yeah, through the depression. Through was. the depression, they're living. Uh, her selling butter uptown. Uh, but it was a, the carton always got me. I mean, it was a beautiful uh, blue and white, kind of like your plates are, with a cow atmosphere in the back. And then on one side, it, it said uh, Avis Allison, was it? You're Mrs. Frank Allison. Uh, uh, an yeah. address and. I remember I think I might not be phone number. I still remember the phone number from back then. And there's no party line. Or when you crank it, somebody hear it ring, they go eavesdrop. Do you remember how many rings your ring was? Yeah. Uh, it was the last two numbers. It was two one. It was two long and a short. 9510F21. Now the rest of my memory is bad. <laughs> so when your parents took over the farm, can you talk us through the layout of the farm at that time? Barns and ponds and such? Um, if you would get that picture of somebody right there. And, well, right up there on yeah, the wall. Yeah, no, but I, I need that picture. Okay, he spoke of the cistern, which is still there. It, but it was on the uh, opposite side of that house, wasn't it? Yeah. Normally the cistern is close to the to a door where it was handy. And part of this I'm kind of speculating. I'm pretty sure it was right outside of the south door. That might have been three or four foot, or it might have been 10 or 15 feet. I'm not sure of that. And it's still there. So then in 19, whenever the, my grandparents built this house, they built it to where they made the cistern on the north side of the house. And another reason they used to do that was so they could put a gutters on the house and have a downspout to put water in the cistern. And uh, then this barn here, when they built, the brick house, they moved this house here down up to the east or to the left of this barn here and left a driveway where you could drive through. And that was a combination uh, granary, uh, milk barn, and shed. There was a long shed here for cattle to get out of the weather. And that's kind of the arrangement of the homestead in itself. And then of course they built a chicken house out here somewhere, and outdoor toilet, uh, that kind of stuff. This was the main layout of the house and barn. And this is the, this is my grandfather, my dad, my brother, and his daughter. But the farm part. There was a small field, nine acres, south here, a half a mile or almost a half a mile. This kind of flat hilltop there that they broke out the sod and planted some kind of crop there. I'm not sure what. And the same thing over in the northeast corner of the quarter. They broke out about that much there. For um, oats, the oats used to be a main crop so they could feed the horses and cattle if need be and so on. And another thing here, when they first come up here, the whole family, they had all their cattle, which I don't know whether it's five or six head or 10 or 12 or what it was, but that was part of my dad and his two brothers' job every day was to find them cows because there was no fence, no fence whatsoever. They hadn't got around the building that yet. So they would uh, have to find them cows, you know, make sure they hadn't strayed away, which I don't think they was gonna leave, but 
He said the grass was so tall, the blue stem grass, that they had to ride pretty well up on a cow before she could sit. Because she was laying down, especially. So it's far cry from what it is now. What now it's done like this tabletop. Well, tell them about what Grandpa used to say, your dad, when he was a kid, about the trees on the crook on Cash. Yeah. Uh, this is a little bit hazy looking. It looks like you might can see some trees up there in the horizon down here on this creek. Well, now there's, you can't see across the creek because of the trees. It's all trees. And I asked my dad uh, not that many years before he passed away. I said, how come there's, um, you say there was no trees and there's no trees showing that picture. And he said, no, there was no trees. I said, well, what about Cash Creek? This is a big creek right back west here. He said, no, there was a few big old creeks, but there was no smaller, younger trees or brush or anything like that. I said, well, how come? He said, the longhorns, the buffalo, the deer, and every wildlife kept it all eat off, anything green, as far as on the creeks. Now, I guess they must not like blue stem or uh, more of it than they could eat, I'm sure, but they concentrate on the creeks where they had water and they eat all of the young trees. Well, how could they tell which cows were theirs and which ones uh, were back in those names, days? And everything. <laughs> I'm not sure of that. I don't think they branded them then. They could have cut notches in their ear or something. Well, do you know how they actually moved, physically moved the house? Probably on some telephone poles, or they might have cut some trees. Well, there were no trees. Probably a telephone pole, two telephone poles and jack it up and slide them poles under it and let it down on it and then hook up two or three teams on it and drag it. Now what year would that would have been? Um, it would have been after 1912. Did they have phone or electric poles then? Uh, oh yeah, they had telephone poles. I'm not sure when the telephone come to happen, but the telephone lines were, I guess, owned by the customers, and they had to maintain them. So if I had a big storm and broke a bunch of poles off that, they'd go muster up some more poles and put it back up. And another thing on them, they wasn't very high off the ground. My dad had bought a combine in a uh, 30s, probably lower, lower 30s to 35, 6, 7, 8. A combine, pretty good tall combine. And it used to be my job, I was little then, to get up in the grain bin and when they'd have to go under one of these telephone lines to get a hold of it, raise it up over the whatever it was hanging on. And if somebody turned that crank, it, it would really shock you. It wouldn't hurt you, but it was quite a shock. What were some of your other chores? Uh, Chickens? Yeah. Cleaning the chicken house. That was just about an every Saturday job. And of course, my sister was supposed to help me, but we'd usually end up getting in a fuss or something. And my mother would say, Yo, when have you come in the house? It'd usually be her. And uh, she put all of the chicken litter out on her yard. And she used to have the most beautiful garden you could imagine. And most of this was after they got the running water. And of course, she would carry her wash water from wherever she had her wash machine setting out to the little trees, and garden and so on. But it, I'm sure it would sound funny to some people. We drew up, grew up there during the depression 
but my sister and I didn't, I'm not going to say we were spoiled by a long shot, but we never really realized that we didn't have everything we needed. But you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And uh, she had to go to town at least once a week to take her butter to where they had cold, cold storage refrigeration. And we'd end up going to town at least, I think, twice a week. She would have to take the butter because it wouldn't, it wouldn't heat for a week. And we'd end up then going to a movie after afternoon. And even we used to get popcorn. But uh, that was kind of a, a treat in them days. Now this is the, my uncle, I think that got married, uh, possibly about the time this house was built, or it could have been a little bit before that house was even built. And they had 12 kids, I think it was. And, and this is, uh, this is my dad, I think, here. It don't look like him, but in the size, age, it wouldn't have to be. This is one of my uncles, and, and this is uh, would be one of my aunts, but I don't remember for sure who was the oldest. It was uh, don't look at me. Uh, I don't know. I'm I can't honestly. Goldie's the only one I know, and I don't know if she was even born then. I don't think she was. So you know the other ones, I don't. You know, I barely remember Hugh. Well, I think and he this was, was the oldest. This would have been my aunt Lily. So, um, how much older was Hugh than Grandpa? Well, you can kind of see with their size. I'm sure this was Grandpa and this is Hugh. So probably 10 years at least. Mm -hmm. About. But it kind of fascinates me, the chickens and maybe turkeys. Bigger than chickens look like. And then down here, the machinery, uh, I never really tried to figure out what that was, but it, one of them looks like a hatch. It was kind of like a buggy, it had a, a top on it, and I think two seats. And then this is a rake, and this is a mower. And one of the little workhorses standing there, another one over here. That's kind of amazing there. Tell her about the grandpa used to plant. Uh, he'd carry what uh, a bushel of wheat on his shoulder out yeah. to the. This is when it uh, fall time, probably fall come in early and a lot of rain, a real rainy season. And I don't know, was it on the home place or right out here? Right here, on the, this school quarter. Uh, yeah, there was a gate right down the road here about. Um, block or a little over on each side of the road. You could open both them gates and drive cattle back and forth across or take the machinery across and so on. And he would just unhook from the drill when it a, a horse, a team of horses. Started raining, he'd unhook, take the horses across the road. And then when it dried up enough that he could sow, he would put a sack full of wheat on his shoulder and take the horses back to the drill and the wheat back to the drill and hook up and he said he might go one round or he might go several rounds and rain again. But that was, it was the way it was. He began to rent more land then, I guess right at the end of World War II. And the only time he ever worked off of the farm well, it was at least two times. One time was driving a taxi cab, I guess during World War One. He must not have been quite old enough to have been in World War One. And I think all it consisted of was driving from Lawton to Fort Sale and back. But he got a little bit of pay out of that. And then he, later, after the Depression was all over and everything, he went to work for the county 
grading roads, building ponds. And that was kind of where he began to buy a little bit more and better equipment. And I think he had enough money to buy a new pickup. And that was. Do you remember his first tractor? Um, no, I remember the second one, but I don't remember the first one. How about the first time you rode, rode one? Well, just like yesterday. Um, okay. In the field over here, a mile east, place I had rented, and was cutting combine and wheat with this old combine I was talking about. And my brother was driving the tractor, and my dad was running the combine, and I was along. Well, my brother, I don't know when it started, but he informed my dad that he had a date, Saturday night date. Of course, my dad said, well, son, we just got started combine. Sure need to get going. And my brother didn't like that. He wasn't a farmer, really. That's this fellow right here. He's deceased now. So uh, finally, after they kind of argued back and forth a little bit, he turned around, looked at me, and said, "Son, can you drive that tractor?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he he was just like from you to the wall from me. In other words, he could have he could have stepped up there to me or something if he got in trouble or hollered at me one or something. And that might have made it worse if he'd hollered. But that was my first driving a tractor with nobody else on the tractor. Then shortly after that. I'd done pretty good, I guess, driving pulling the combine. So he took me over to on the same place to another field to plow the same old tractor. And he got me lined out there to plow. And he went two or three rounds with me watching him. And he went around or so with him watching me. There's plenty of room on the old tractor to set or stand. And he, he said, well, I'm gonna go. And he was plowing in another field with another tractor. But it was about a half a mile or more away. He said, now son, if you kill this old tractor, you're gonna have to walk to me, because you cannot crank it. And it was, you know, one of them you had to crank by hand. What model tractor? D. A, a B? D. D. Biggest tractor John Deere made at the time. Okay. So, uh, oh. I plowed and I don't remember of having, I might not have made as pretty a corners as he would like to have had, but I made it through the day and didn't kill a tractor. And after that, it was every day did. <laughs> you wish you hadn't volunteered, didn't you? Almost. <laughs> well, did you have to get up early and help milk if your brother made so much butter? No. Um, um, I had quite a few outside chores that I would do while they were still milking the cow. Now my mother would go down to the dairy barn and help him do the milking. Now if it was something come up that they needed me if one of them was sick, something like that. Now my dad used to go deer hunting in Colorado uh, every year there for a number of years. And he would turn his all me and my mother had. And uh, we would do the Helping of the cows and the feeding of the cows, and she would clean up the dairy utensils and all that, and get us off to school. Get a long time. And then come home and do it all over again. Yeah, I was, yeah, that's about what I was out of I always kind of felt sorry for my dad after I realized kind of what farming was. He would have to quit, you know, way before dark, and go in to milk the cow. And it was still way after dark when you get in the house. And I was kind of felt sorry for him because he loved to farm. And he'd be doing something in the field that was kind of critical and he'd have to quit and go milk the cow. And he knew that was his bread and butter so. Well, how long did they do the dairy did, as, as their income? Uh, about 50 years, 40 or 50 years. So they went through the hand milk into the... Yeah. Um, now he he was, I don't know whether he was that, 
uh, mechanical talented or what, but I guess he bought one of the first milking machines. It was a Ford, it had nothing to do with Ford Motor Company, but a Ford milker. It had these little brass tubes with a piston in it. It went back and forth, it caused the vacuum. And it run, they run it with a stationary gasoline motor. Uh, remember a belt went up through the ceiling to a what's called pump jack. And it turned this mechanism that made a, a board about a two by two square go back and forth. And that's what worked these pumps. It was a good milker. I mean, it may have been hard on the cows. I don't know that part because it was, it, it didn't, it wasn't time like they are now. It was either just, it was either pulling or pushing one of the two. But it was a whole lot better than milking by hand. And we used, of course, have to milk by hand when electricity was off. And that was pretty regular when they first put in all these hundreds of miles of lines. But we lived through it. Wouldn't take wouldn't take anything for water for them days, but I wouldn't pay a whole lot to go through them again. Well, federal federal regulations probably impacted some of that too. No. No? There was no regulation then on with the dairy? Or maybe they got out really, of it. No. Got, got out of it before yeah. that started then. Well, I mean they they come in first with with your just straight milk. It had to be pasteurized. Okay, then they kept adding more to it, where finally they was where an inspector would come and inspect your dairy for cleanliness and so on. But on the selling cream or selling the butter. Yeah, see, they never sold the milk. Oh, okay. They just milked the cows for the cream. Yes, for, okay. But they done that so she would have the cream to make mm -hmm. the butter. And then another thing, if electricity was off even in later years, it was usually my job to sit there and turn the cream separator to separate the cream. Well, with her having spent most of her time doing that, did she uh, belong to any home demonstration clubs? Yes. I mean, I also suppose that was for everybody. And it pretty much was back then, you know, the country people. Yeah, she used to have the club meetings at her house and they just make a round of where they'd have the meetings. And it was always a pretty big deal. I have a quilt that I won up here at the schoolhouse. I don't remember what the occasion was. It was probably a fundraiser or some kind of box supper or pie supper or something. And they had a drawing then on this quilt and I won that quilt. And I think it's down here in the closet. It would have been back in the 50s, 60s? No, it was probably in the, mm -hmm. probably in the 40s. So did the home at, ne home at club make yet? Yeah, I'm sure they did, or maybe they were just, there really wasn't much separating them because pretty well everybody of that age and married and so on belonged to the club. Home Economics Club. Now, I can remember when they had to change the name. The government made them change the name in some way because mm -hmm. there was no club involved. I mean, they could have probably left it a club, but it had a lot more regulation or something on it. But they just, Home Economics Group, I think it was. And, yep, by that. Were you in 4-H or FFA? Oh, yes. 4-H. I couldn't join until I was eight. And the same school term, I would become eight years old. My dad let me buy her, had the county agent that was in charge of us, buy me a real good Duroc gilt. I think she came from Elk City or somewhere like that. 
And uh, I could show her, but I couldn't get the prize money or the ribbon or anything for her. But I could show her, and uh, I did, and she got first first place. I didn't get anything out of it, except experience. Well, how come? Because I wasn't old enough. Mm -hmm. I hadn't had it for a year. I was old, I was eight years old, but I, you had to have your project for a year or something to that effect. Well, where'd you go to school? Fire Mound, mile north there. Why don't you tell him a little bit about that grandpa? There's and, some pictures over there in Denham. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my, my dad, he started him, school. Tell him your dad or, or Kelsey? No, Kelsey didn't go to school. Either. Okay, tell him how. You know, I've always asked y'all how they come up with the name Flower Mound. Um, I know I've heard so many different stories on that, but I ain't sure of that. Do you? No, I, I just heard you something mention about, about uh, this a mound there with flowers on it, and that was because yeah, they was trying to come up with a name. That was it. It wasn't anyone, I don't think, in the community. It could have been. But they... Uh, well, that's close enough to walk back and forth. He rode uh, his pony. Rode his pony. <laughs> I didn't have time to walk. Yeah. And it was just tied up outside and right back home? No, we had a horse barn. Shed. And go in there and tie him up. Go out recess and talk to him. And so on and... That was, uh, I always remember the boards, they had kind of stall sticks for them. And they had the big 2 by 12 plank boards to separate it. Well, something about them boards, horses like to eat on. And they would eat them boards coming too sometimes. And I'm sure they were deficient on some mineral or something like that. Well, what would you pack for lunch or take for lunch? Probably, Probably uh... That's where the... Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, sausage sandwich. My mother would fry sausage, cook sausage in the morning, and come up for me and my sister lunch then. And sometimes it was bologna, which I still like bologna. And uh, usually a cupcake. I don't really remember any potato chips or anything like that. I think she must have knew about the health food back then. <laughs> of course, sausage wasn't real all that greasy. It was. But you worked it off. Yeah. In those days. Um. Okay. Don't. I got a picture. I can't find it though. This is the original school that was that was here. It's not at the location. At the school, it, actually, the, the school is still around. It's on the quarter across the road, just right up here. Uh, his cousin, her and her husband, bought the old school house. House. Uh, when was that? The school, the new one built. I was in the army overseas. And that would have been 55. 55. Like they, they didn't know what to do with the old school. So his cousin, or, or did he no, buy okay, it? You bought it? Okay, his his uncle bought it. And they and it's still up here. And this this is where they was placing it beside a old, their old house. And they lived in it for up until, what, 40 years ago? Uh, up here's this picture here. It, it's a background. I mean, you can't. This is where it was originally set in the Fairport Fire Mount School. This is a non denominational Sunday school. That's where I went to. I'm not saying any church I had was then. Okay, now let me find this other picture. Uh, Was it a one-room school when you went? Yes. When you went? One room, one teacher. And about how many children? Forty-five. Forty grades. Eight. One through eight. 
Uh, was it one room or two rooms? No, it was one room. Well, when I went there, it was two rooms. It had a, they had a petition between it had a curtain. The first, second, and third was in one room, and fourth, fifth, and sixth was in the other right here. So you went to the same actual same room? Yeah. Uh, yeah. My dad, uh, my brother and sister, me. This is it here. This is right shortly after it was built. And that part with the arches and bell, it's still there. Uh, it's still, you, and, but they have added so much to it. Um, That's the one we passed coming in. Yeah. Did you notice the cemetery? Uh-huh. Okay, that was formed after the school was actually, after the school was built. And uh, the person that lived there on that quarter of land, they lived on the further east. Had a, oh, that was an infant. I think it was a, it was either infant or real young. I, I always thought the cemetery was built before the school. No. Mm. Uh, another thing, the school, original school, it was built there. And I'm not sure whether that was 19, one, two, or three, right in that area. They was fixing to have a Christmas program at night and the school burned before they got there. But they practiced and everything and put up decorations and went home. And while they, after they went home, come back, it's burning. And a lot of people think it was probably, uh, I don't know whether they had candles on the tree, sure or not. But they, uh, the, the schoolhouse burned down. And I said, well, what did y'all do about school then? You want to build another one? <laughs> that, and, uh, that would okay. be it. Okay, that would be the, so that, there's that, the one that's there now is actually the third one? Mm -hmm. Okay. But that's the one you went to school in, right? Yep. Okay, that's why it was one room. That's the difference. The, I went to the one that I showed you a while ago that was freshly built, and it was a two room. And, uh, yeah, but it was still just a. It is concrete. Curtain. Uh, uh, here's pictures of across the road. Uh, that's uh, was out buildings back when his dad was a uh, pretty pretty prosperous in his farming operation. Uh, How many acres were were y'all farming at that time? Your father. Uh, and counted up and because it would ha it was it was way more than the one sixty. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I, uh, when did y'all acquire the hundred and twenty or two? Okay. Probably the beginning of World War Two. Uh, now that wasn't when he bought it, but that's when he started farming it. Okay. Did, did he have any other places up in yeah. Cash Creek? Yeah, he had the Vandermark place, the Murphy place, and the Whitmore place, and 80 acres of the Merritt place across the road. Okay. Uh, Would you all have people help with the farming? No. Maybe haul hay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, the thrashing, because there wasn't that many uh, combines then. And the thrashing, um, that was a, the thrasher machine belonged to my uncle that lived right next door here. And he never did have a tractor enough to run it very good. And my dad acquired a good tractor, better tractor, I should say. You can think she's listening to something. But anyway, there was, that was a crew. There was probably 20 or 25 people that would go around to the, this neighborhood doing the thrashing. Uh, now, in them pictures, another big thing besides the uh, wheat harvest was a silage feed. And in them there pictures is, is a, a ground dug silage pit that was on this quarter cross road. And them pictures are uh, where all the neighbors cut and hauled silage together. And they did this go from one farmer's place to another. And how long would that last? Oh, usually not over 
three weeks at the most. But, uh, and what did your mother have to cook for the crew? When they were on our your, property. Your uh, there was another school in this area called Woodlawn. This is it right here. Uh, the reason they closed the doors on it was because it was a lack of students to keep it open. Yeah. Yeah. And it was uh, from this quarter, it would have been a mile and a half south. So basically from Flower Mound School, they was only two and a half miles apart. That that's not very far apart. Not very far, and to have that many students and well, it was I think every three miles it would be noted in the, for the school. And I always wondered why there wasn't a schoolhouse on every school quarter. See, this quarter here is a school quarter. There was never a school on there. Was it possibly that because of the Flyermount well, School? Well, no, up those there. up there, if you if you could count back, those up there on Bishop Road are, uh, I think it's ever three miles or something, close to that. And something else I hadn't said, and it don't really pertain to this exactly, but the house where, where this house is sitting, I had bought from the school land department way back when wife and I first married. And uh, the rest of it we farmed, but since then we kind of decided or that Well, since here about 10 years ago, the city of Lawton come in and had their version of what they wanted. They, they outbid us on the school land, which I mean, it, it, that's what it's for. It goes to the highest bidder. And they bid it so high where, you know, there was no way we could afford to rent it, to farm it, because it wouldn't, would have, wouldn't have paid for itself. So, and their thoughts of getting it was to build an 18-hole golf course. And where they was going to get the water to irrigate it, just in the last five years, they built a new freshwater treatment plant. Just on, it's on this school section, but it's a quarter west here. That all happened about the same time. And the, they was going to use the wastewater from the plant to irrigate the 18-hole golf course. Well, all the golf course uh, facilities within the area uh, got it stopped. Well, so, there was enough of them, they didn't need uh, it. It just, it just one of them deals. And then there after that, it just, you know, we kind of lost interest in it. Uh, it really is not that good of a farm and uh, we knew that we would have a lot of what I call city farmers coming out here wanting to as a hobby raise you know cattle or whatever and uh, but a neighbor of ours that's a pretty prosperous has got it now and, and uh, he farms well he so. had the lease next to it but uh, we had this school quarter was in the Allison the Alli farm by the Allison since 1912. 1912 up until probably about 12, 15 years ago. So, uh, so when your parents were finished farming, it came to you? My, I at some point, well, it's while I was in the army. My dad, I don't know what his age was then, he was at least 70. But his health was beginning to slow up, slow him up. And I was over in Germany. My mother wrote me a letter and asked what my intentions were when I got out. I said, well, I want a farm. He said, okay. Said, we were just wondering, said, uh, your daddy's gonna have to slow up here soon. And uh, said there's a place that we farmed had farmed for years for sale, and he was wondering about whether y'all should buy it. And I wrote back and told her yes that I definitely want to farm. So um, I got back then when we kind of 
we didn't divide everything right down the middle or anything like that. It was just like this. Now the cattle is about the only thing that we did kind of split 50-50. When you'd sell a calf crop off of it, well, half of it was mine, half of it was his. Well, I'd give him my half until it amounted to a kind of a set price I had on the cows. Then uh, the machinery, I had a little bit of machinery and he had what more we needed and then we farmed that way for him. Ten, eight or ten years, ten years probably. And in the meantime I had bought a backhoe, the third one in southwest Oklahoma. And I, I had a lot I had a lot of work, a lot of business. But that wasn't what I wanted. I wanted a farm. So then my dad got where he couldn't do all the farming. So I just quit that contracting business and bought my equipment and come back home. And um, actually, uh, well, I'll put that in. The farm prospered, didn't seem like about that time. Four. Of course, there was two of us working it where it was just then. And the times were changing too about right, that right. time too. So you lived here, mm -hmm. you, you and your wife, and then, so Greg, you would have been, well, not born in this house, but you came back to this house after. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and his sister. And so what was your, what were you farming in, at that point? Wheat or? Uh, it was pretty diversified. It was wheat and probably some oats still at that time, alfalfa hay, and Milo, you know what that is? Quite a bit of Milo. So it was kind of diversified. No milking cows for you? No. Not, now they, they did on up until they couldn't. And uh, they wanted to know, you know, if I wanted to take it over. I said, no, no way. <laughs> well, did you have to have hired help? No. To do your, well, I guess that's what Greg was for, huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. There has never been any hard help on the no. Allison farm. Mm -hmm. And then even my, today, I don't have hard help. My wife, she was half owner of a dairy over on it's three miles west over here on the highway. Uh, uh, known dairy family. Uh, I guess when she had that along with her brother. Uh, her and uh, one brother and then another, they had two dairies and they sold milk to the public. Uh, that Driving was my mother. Guitar and fill up your jug, you know. They so, didn't like it. So but. she didn't want, you know, after her and dad married, she didn't want no more dairy in. Cause well, they, she didn't really say that. She said, do you want to? Do you want to keep the dairy? Do you want to work the dairy? No, thank you. <laughs> so she sold out and Followed me. I don't think she was ever sorry of it. And so, Greg, what were some of your chores? Mm. Well, he had show show animals. I, you know, we never had no chickens up here. Or that when I was young, grand my grandfather was still living and still pretty active, somewhat, even though Dad was pretty much the head farmer then. It always, I didn't have that many chores. Um, oh. It was always, it was probably later in my life that I learned to, to drive and operate the machinery because my grandfather was still able to, and anytime something would come about, he was always wanting to do it. Now, he was a whole lot older, and he had slowed up a lot, And but it was hard for me to understand his passion to farm because, you know, here I'm a young kid coming about wanting to learn how to drive a tractor because that's all exciting. And it took me a long time to understand why it was hard for him to give it up. 
and when it he finally when he finally give in it he I could tell he was hurt very deeply that I guess in a way I was replacing him and you know it really wasn't that a way it was just you no, know he was he was beyond it, it, you know I was going to have to learn how to you know I was more older in life learning to drive a tractor than my dad was but um it was one reason my grandfather just didn't want to give it up and uh i didn't understand it for a long time but um i do nowadays but um i guess my chores uh when i was in grade school uh, probably one of our biggest cash crops besides wheat was alfalfa hay and that's what i specialize in now is uh, raising and selling alfalfa hay to the public, which his dad and he did also, which a lot of our neighbors around here, their alfalfa hay was grown for their own livestock, which, you know, we, we've we always had livestock, but not in the abundance like our neighbors have. Uh, Some of that there is. But it, when I was in grade school, he built a hay truck to haul the small square bales on. And um, I was I was too young to physically uh, last all day, uh, you know, handling each bale. Uh, so it was dad and a, a neighbor fella that was probably about 12 years older than me that physically handled the hay and I had to drive the truck in the field but then when we got to the barn, they would get up in the barn to stack the hay, and I would have to manage to pull these hay stacks. They would stack four bales high on this truck, and I remember it was all I could do is to pull them bales down and uh, lift them, you know, a couple of inches off the floor and put on a, this conveyor chain to stick them on up into the barn, and uh, that was... Uh, I hated it for the longest because it was it was hard work, um, but you know finally got where I was kind of enjoying it some, um, and then in later years, uh, as time goes by, it was harder to find people that wanted to physically do physical labor, and uh, and then that was getting in the time where he was starting to retire or almost retired and I started taking over and uh, I basically needed to realize some means of handling our alfalfa growth crops without using a whole lot of labor to do it and uh, that's when I uh, diversified and bought some different hay equipment which consists of a bigger uh, type of baler and now I let the bigger tractor loaders do all the handling and, uh, but uh, round bales now? Uh, square bales, the bigger square, square bales um, so uh, but actually when I was a kid I didn't have the chores like he did because the chickens and cattle was across the road of grandpa and grandma's house. And, you know, I guess when I was real young, me and my sister used to go uh, collect the eggs, but uh, it always bothered me. It seemed like most, at least once a week, we'd go in there and there'd be a bull snake. Not do not like snakes. And uh, it, I'd hurt myself trying to get out of there. And, uh, well, don't forget your show pigs. You know, I, had, them. I had show pigs. Uh, 4-H too. Though. No, I was never in 4-H. Uh, it was FFA. Uh, done uh, well with them. Probably could have done exceptionally well with them if I had a little more experience as being a showman. Uh, I was lacking showmanship, but as far as having the taking care of the animals and keeping them healthy and uh, having the proper ones to, you know, 
to impress the judges, uh, I did well there. So his mother kept him occupied. I guess I could say in grade school, pretty much wrestling. And was you ever on on a roll? No, I never liked school. I always wanted to be out on the farm. <laughs> but, uh, so was it a hard decision deciding to retire yourself? When it was when you decided to no, I had to. She, mom was a, a very proud person, a very hard working person. Um, she was a professional cook for school her whole life, and uh, she her last cooking job was up here at Fire Mountain School. I fed a uh, hundred up to one hundred and fifty kids, and she had one helper, and every day for lunch they had a hot dinner rose mm -hmm. and uh, she was a hard working woman uh, she had a big garden too uh, we always suspected that she possibly had some heat strokes yeah. uh, working the garden uh, and uh, then later in life you know she can start to have the mini strokes and uh, but that's what she died from but uh, she made me, asked me, and made me promise her that we'd never put her, put her in the rest home. Mm -hmm. And uh, I made that promise, so. So her work, and she helped supplement the income for the family too then? Oh, yeah. Just the, yeah. What did you work, did you have another job besides the farm? The back home. The back, oh, yeah, you gave it, and you switched. And I got hurt in that pipe fell off of the bank down in the ditch and hit me back. And um, later on, I don't remember how many years it was, six, eight, maybe 10 years, I had to have back surgery. And that is why I can't walk now. I mean, it, well, this, this, it rubbed on the spinal cord, the vertebrae. Well, back up there, the surgery that you had, that fixed that problem, but He's yeah. got ill. He's got ill reversible nerve damage in his low. Uh, a feet and leg. They couldn't fix that. Pro I mean, both of them was back problems. They could fix one, but they couldn't fix the other. And that's why he he's not very. He can't get around. Very There's well. nerve damage to the spinal cord. Uh, my feet started getting numb, and then it started up my leg, and it was almost to my knee when I. Finally got an appointment and got in to see a doctor. And he said, well, if you don't have this surgery, you'll be in a wheelchair. Um, Within a year. Yeah, or less. So that was... Uh, and I went ahead and, and was able to get around and work quite a long time after that, but I got arthritis real bad. And a combination of all that. Uh, another thing kind of interesting here, I always heard about the school kids getting out pick cotton and one thing or another. Uh -huh. Well, I don't know, apparently I didn't that year. Perfect attendance, probably <laughs> not. Unless it was unless it was uh, approved absence, then maybe. Well, I don't think I got any of them because one time I was having a rabbit drive. Rabbits are terrible. Drive. And you know, as this when the whole community would get together and they come together on a thousand rabbits. Now was these jackrabbits? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, they're almost a thing of the past. And uh, I wanted to get out for to to do that. I was big enough to handle a gun. Would you use guns or clubs? Gun. Mm. I don't know. I had this part somewhere to let them out, and then you shot as they went out. But my mother wouldn't. She wouldn't hear to it. <laughs> and now they devastated the country. Yeah, they. They, I don't remember how to what extent, but there was something you didn't want on your wheat because you wouldn't mm -hmm. have much harvest. Would you have any issues with grasshoppers in the thirties? Not so much. There was, there was times they would be bad, but eat the bark off the fence post and mm -hmm. the bark off the trees, and the, they'd eat some small fence posts too, I guess. No. Hole handles and shovel handles. When you made your fence, did you use wood from the 
property or now this down on old homestead most all the posts on it and i don't know what the first post it was put on it was but my grandfather planted bodark trees down there on that creek and they're still there dozens of them and they would cut them at the right time you know if you want a corner post you'd let them get pretty big if you just wanted to post out in the line like real small ones are right there them things is almost indestructible they'll last almost forever and they had quite a bit of areas fenced off with hog wire woven wire and they raised a lot of hogs down in like on the range or something it wouldn't be that big but maybe a five or ten acre spot for the hogs run. Is it a smokehouse then for ham? Yeah. yeah. Good stuff, huh? Sure enough. Well, we haven't talked about holidays. We need to get into that just a little bit. Whose house would you go to and what would oh. be some of the favorite foods? Um, that jumped around a whole lot. My mother wasn't real crazy about some of her in-laws. And now I'm not saying she wouldn't associate with them, but um, that's, I'm hoping. It's okay. <laughs> but uh, I can remember my mother's sister. And my mother moved here from Indiana. I can't tell you what year, but it's all up in the teens. And uh, they, her sister was born, I think, after they moved down here. But my mother had to take care of her when she was little because her mother had died. And I think her, her dad married after that, but my mother didn't get along with her at all. But anyway, they, uh, the sister used to come either, we would go to Oklahoma City for Thanksgiving or Christmas, one of the two, and they would come down here the other than Thanksgiving or Christmas, whichever it was. And that was the main holidays, and we had get-togethers, a community get-togethers. We'd have at least two to three weenie roasts every fall and winter would have one or two watermelon feeds in well, the summer. Well, uh, part of what's still a tradition in this community is uh, Memorial Day services appear yeah. to school uh, in a recognition of the loved ones that's passed away that's in the cemetery and to also recognize, you know, the service uh, and that, that's, how long has that been going on? It's still... Uh, 80 close to 90 years, um, and we still have services every year. I don't know if any program right okay. And then, um, uh, uh, Easter, Easter Sunday, a picnic on the creek. Now, uh, that has had been going on forever until about two years ago, and uh, has been some. Uh, drastic illnesses and deaths within uh, some of the other families and uh, I, I guess a little bit of lack of reorganization and getting it, well, keep still, it keeping it going I hope they still have it at the schoolhouse we didn't it. have it last year or the year before no um, uh, them two main things are still conducted within the community and um that's then box suppers and pie suppers <laughs> galore they was uh usually at the schoolhouse and if you had a girlfriend you'd want her pie but you didn't let anybody know it i said run it price way up on you same way the boxes but it's, it's all fun it was to me holidays it was always exciting to go across the road uh something about grandma's house now uh, her his sister 
uh, her and her husband, after they married, moved to the city. And they had two boys, which were uh, from three to five years older than me. But it was always exciting. to s We was real close. It was always exciting to see them because they was town boys. And but it was exciting for them to come down here too. But uh, uh, it was always fun going to Grandma, even though you know it's just a walk across the field to get there. Um, uh, always good eating. What would she fix? Oh, the everything. Just uh, you know, uh, as far as Thanksgiving, all the main courses. The one main thing I always remembered, and I think my sister got the recipe is the. The carrot salad, this the slivered carrots in like a jello with a, yeah, then, with pecans and the gosh, <laughs> I could eat the whole bowl. Uh, but um, you know, the traditional Thanksgiving every time, and then uh, Christmas was pretty close to Thanksgiving as far as what they would fix. Um, it's got more so that way in recent years, where there's not much difference in Thanksgiving dinner and Christmas dinner. Now I remember the first time somebody said sliced pie in front of me and said that's sweet potato pie. Yeah, I don't want that. I can't tell any difference in it, really. Oh, and I got in bad trouble one. I think it was Thanksgiving. Um, the way the house was situated down there, they had a pretty big dining room table, probably as big as this one, once let out, in uh, the main room of the house. Then uh, the kids, children, would have to eat in the kitchen. It was just a doorway apart. And they would always ask the blessing and so on. And it was mainly three of us boys, my two cousins and me. And we was cutting up all the time. Someone in the other room got us squatting down and they said the prayer. It was over with just kind of a low voice. I said, Amen, Brother Ben, shot a goose until the end. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never did think I was the one that said that, but they both agreed that I was, so I guess I probably was. <laughs> I ain't never heard that before. <laughs> and then what happened to you? Nothing. <laughs> You shouldn't do that. <laughs> well, who would usually do the discipline if it needed needed to be done? My mother mainly. She got your attention. She it was a tamarack bush, tree, shrub, just outside the door, and she kept a tamarack switch. So it wasn't nothing as big as a pencil, but she kept it up on top of the refrigerator that was right there in the edge of the kitchen. And she could make you dance, <laughs> and you didn't forget it. Well, finally, after we got older, we blame each other, my sister and I, for different things. So she then switched to one of us. Okay, you switch her. When you get through, she's gonna switch you. <laughs> I didn't like that. <laughs> well, my sister, she didn't have any mercy on me. But if she didn't, well, she'd get it again from the mother. And when it was time to discipline you, who did it? Uh, my mother. Uh, she she grew up. She was the youngest of five five kids. Uh, she her the oldest of her family was a a sister, and then three boys. So then three boys. She grew up with them because the older sister was quite a bit older than the other three boys, um, and. They was quite ornery growing up, and they teased her, I guess, a lot. And but I mean, she, she took it well, uh, but she, um, she didn't. Mom was somewhat short tempered. Uh, didn't put up with no horseplay, and uh, when she hollered, you listened. And then if it was severe, then when Dad come in. Uh, the bell off the off of a saddle was the answer to the story, and uh, take the buckle off. I'll tell you what, boy, that ain't often. I mean, 
and we I, we probably still have it. It was always a new looking. Uh, it was a what girdle gir- girder belt off of a saddle, and uh, it it wasn't used that much, but because it always brought back remembrance of the last time it <laughs> that was, was pulled a purpose. out. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I think the main thing, mom, uh, and it's just like kids back then they wanted their kids to show respect which yeah that without saying today uh that was a big thing if you wasn't real polite to your elder first time they got you off to yourself they'd say don't you understand that you're supposed to have respect for them and we didn't say yes sir no sir and stuff like that but Say Mr. and Mrs. So I'm not calling by the maid her first name. I know Grandma a time or two got after me and my sister, and that was that always ashamed me worse because I knew if she got on to us that we was gonna get it here too. Uh, it actually kind of embarrassed me because she's, you know, a grandma, but. Uh, there wasn't very often we would get on our nerves. What's grandma you talking about? Grandma Allison. Yeah, that's what I figured. Uh, you didn't get the switch. Uh, I can't remember what it was. It hasn't been a camera accident. Probably so. <laughs> uh, All she ever hit us with, uh, that was enough. <laughs> see, uh, on actually on both sides of his family and my mother's, I was the youngest. So uh, all of my cousins even though his sister is younger than him, she married before he did and had kids. So, uh, you know, them older kids would come down and get me in trouble every time because I didn't know any different. But uh, I wouldn't trade it for nothing. It was a lot of fun. Well, today on the farm, you... You're involved with the alfalfa production. Are you doing anything else? Are you running cattle or? Uh, had cattle up until about a month ago. Hmm. Uh, sold the cattle. Run out of hay. And- a, a number of different reasons. Um, the cattle, I don't, we have never had that many cattle. Uh, 20, from 20 to 25, 30 mama cows at the most. Uh, the cattle operation was never as far as his or my uh, part of the operation of the farming was never that big of a thing. Um, our biggest reason I went ahead and sold was there has been cattle on this home, the homestead since basically 1901. Mm -hmm. Okay. After going through what we did last summer, the, the grass, was eaten into the ground. Okay. I had enough hay to keep them. I started having to feed hay back in August of last year. Okay. That took up what hay I had left over from the last, this past winter um, until I got some wheat pasture and I grazed my, the wheat pasture and um, this, the the price of cattle are real good knowing not to not to know what to expect next this coming spring i mean yeah i think early spring will be great but then this summer Mm -hmm. i don't know what to expect this summer and then not having the hay you know i'm in the market of selling hay not buying it and it was just i felt like this would be a time to go ahead and maybe sell out for the time being, and I can always buy back later. Now they say, different ones say, well, they're going to be, you, you know, so expensive to buy back. Well, you know, that's just well, life. You wouldn't want to buy that many anyway. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to buy that many right off the bat. This, uh, the cattle I had was a mixed breed, but they was pretty much from uh, the herd that, my grandfather had short horn, uh, uh, at least some short horn. and uh, after it was like a day after I sold them, uh, I felt bad more <laughs> for the cattle though. Uh, wondering if I did the right thing, but 
you know, the more I think about it, uh, I feel like I've done what I needed to do. Um, you made a statement there because we got all grazed it into the ground. Well, I mean, yeah, I agree, but it was because it didn't grow any. That's right. Um, the weather had a, I mean, it will come back, yeah. but it's not going to come back like it normally would. Mm -hmm. um, you know, after a period of time, a pasture land does need a rest mm -hmm. where it can come back and get to, you know, more coverage over the barren ground. I mean, there's ground out there that's kind of bearing. So uh, I just, you know, I'm trying to preserve the land. The thing is, with some of my neighbors that have, are still hanging on, the problem they're foreseeing right now, even though they have enough hay, is the pond water. Mm. Yeah, we're getting rain here every now and then. Like, you know, they're talking about rain this afternoon, tomorrow, and then the next day. But it's it's always been the small two to three tenths. We need two to three inches at once in order to fill the ponds back up. So, you know, we're far, we're not, we're far from out of the woods on the, this drought deal. And uh, last year was a dev devastation for everybody. Um, you I just, any kind of schedule you trying to make? I just hope this spring, I feel like this spring and end of the summer will be good. I just don't know what to expect mid to the end of the summer uh the you know the hot dry weather is one thing but when it don't rain that's bad well, doesn't that impact growing the alfalfa or yes is that the alfalfa is a very durable plant you know basically it, it don't die it basically what it does is it goes into dormancy like it does in the winter time when well, it goes into dormancy in the summer then it takes uh, usually about twice as long. I mean, it's still green, but it just don't grow. Okay, then when you get a rain, you think, well, here in 30 days, I'll have a crop. Well, no, because it's it's got to come back alive and start growing again. So, uh, you know, towards the end of this past uh, summer, fall, because, you know, I've, we've cut hay up until uh, October, November. And we got rains in October. Uh, good rains. We got enough where I got a good uh, uh, wheat up. And I thought, well, shoot, we'll have, you know, at least one more cutting. And it grew, but it was slow coming back out of dormancy. And uh, I finally cut hay in December and it laid for a month and uh, I bailed it January 9th of this year. Uh, unheard of time to be cutting and bailing hay. Alfalfa roots will go 20 foot to water if they have to. Well, if they've gone down there 20 foot to get a drink, well, it can start raining a bunch up here, but of course, a lot of most of your feeder roots are on top, close to the top. Well, it will it'll grow, but until you get some water to that tap root, it's not going to do it real good. Mm -hmm. Do you see that any of your your regular customers maybe are scaling back or having trouble purchasing uh, hay or? Uh, yeah, I got a, a couple of. A commercial, they're people that raise uh, horses, like for uh, cutting horses. Cutting horses. Mm -hmm. um, and one particular one uh, used to probably run uh, from probably 35 to 50 horses, and he's cut back to about 25, 20 to 25. Um, uh, other, uh, yeah, most of them have cut their size back, mm -hmm. uh, keeping them the what they feel like are the the best of the horses. Um, and then you always got the ones that probably would go borrow money to buy, to continue to buy the hay, and you know that's 
that's the passion they have. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, a lot of people have cut way back. Um, uh, one thing I've noticed this since this last summer, and I have noticed it over a few years anyway, of the increase of pro price increases. I mean, we all have. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems like fuel is the beginning and it just escalates from there. But this seems like to me in the last six months, stuff is this has went up so greatly. And, um, you know, I don't want to charge for my commodity and charge people where they don't want to buy it. But the thing is, I got to charge too much in a way where you know I can stay in business, mm -hmm. which and, is too much for my life. And and that's right. That's it's going to be too much for a lot of people. But to, but I have a wide variety of people I sell to. I sell to uh, hay brokers out of Texas, and you know they're struggling down there as bad or worse than we are. Uh, the thing is, uh, what I'll have to figure out. You know, I basically base my price off the Oklahoma market uh, and and then the price can vary up or down in this area on possibly how much hay there is uh, you know I like to get the most I can but you know I do have compassion for my customers I want them to come back so uh, it's just going to it's hard sometimes to price the hay because I'm. All, I guess I have. I worry too much of what the people might think of me if I price it too high. But you know, I'm just trying to stay afloat like everybody else. So it's going to be interesting this spring uh, to see what happens. Um, so. Well, we've talked a lot about the last 100 years. What do you see for the next 100? I don't know. Um, I, in my opinion, in the next, probably in the next probably 15 to 20 years right here, um, possibly home development. Um, we're so close to Lawton. Uh, the thing is, Lawton has pretty much built around us because no nobody in this community wants to sell because they want to keep it what it is. But that won't last forever. I mean, money does the talking. Someday, here soon, someone in the area will sell land for development. Well, when that happens, it'll just be a domino effect. Well, the other problem is, you know, we're pretty much considered smaller, a smaller farm. When, you know, talking about people farming five, 6,000 acres. I mean, we're, uh, you know, if I figured up my cultivation along with my grass, I'm barely, barely a thousand. But you know, that, we we take care of that him and I well I have no hard help so you know my job is a full time job uh, I don't really see that lasting over another 20-25 years uh, I just talking about proximity we are I, to town being this close to town yeah. and it's like what I had said before like they got a lot of hobby farmers mm -hmm. uh, they have made their money elsewhere and they they can they can compete more than I can at times. Uh, you know, I hope I'm wrong, but you know, I, I gotta think about this stuff and face reality. Uh, the the equ equipment has gotten so out of, out of our range. See, what I'm comparing to what we do here is to people like in uh, Iowa or uh, Ohio where they, they got really rich ground up there and they got abundant rainfall okay corn milo crops like that bring big big money 
where down here we're very limited to what we grow because of our heat. Uh, wheat usually comes off in the spring. So, you know, wheat's, wheat, wheat grows good down here. Okay, alfalfa grows good down here. There's other places in the states that grows better because they got a, a better a rainfall. It all comes down to the rainfall. Um, this, this seems like it's just getting harder and harder every year to make things work like they did the year before. And, it, and it's because of the lack of rain. And you know, I they say it will come back someday. I just hope I can hang out until that someday. I don't know when that someday is going to be. It just thing. seems like every year, you know, we're gonna, I'm going to wait until the next year it's going to be better. Well, I'm into it again. I'm hoping this year be better. You know, I think since I survived last year, I can survive a lot of things, but the the increase of the fuel and the increase of the machinery, and you know, I'm not complaining about the, you know, the machinery's gotta increase because of everything is increased on their, their part. I guess my problem is, Wheat, we don't have that much control over wheat. Uh, I didn't well, mean I could talk as much as I had. You've done good. You've done good. Is there any, that, like the next generation that wants uh, to learn? I can take care of his call. Grandkids are interested so in it. We don't want even an Allison to carry the Allison name on. See, like my sister boys. And, uh, but are they even interested uh, in it? Yeah, I thought it's. That and my sister actually three. just has one boy. See the picture? No, no, they're not up there. Okay. Well, we'll be They sure. uh, had a boy that committed suicide. Of course. Uh, right. And they have one other one. And he's a, This, I know you had asked me some questions about the layout. Mm -hmm. This was in later years, I'm going to say, right after World War II. We had no place to work on machinery except just now under shade tree maybe and uh, my dad bought this little building here from a neighbor it was just no tar paper building that they had at Fort Sale during World War II for uh, took the place of tent okay. it had a concrete floor and they throwed up some boards and wrapped it in tar paper and that was it had a little pot belly stove in the middle and that was the barracks for them. And then this building here, uh, Pontiac dealer uptown was updating and he was getting rid of this building and building a new body shop. It was actually an alley behind the dealership. And uh, my dad made a deal for that. And actually him and me and my two uncles, we were pretty well the ones that tore it down and hauled it out here and put it back up. I know uh, the fellow that owned it there said, come out there late one afternoon and said, well, you all ready to get along good with that? And I had an uncle that was about half comical. He said, oh, well, we'd have been a lot further along if we hadn't been putting it back up as we hauled it out there, <laughs> which we wasn't, we just unloading it. That was, uh, was, Always recycled and reused yeah. things, right? Okay, now here's the silo, the trench silo. They just dumped it in with the dirt around it? Oh, yeah. And that's some more that's working on the bulldozer. That was my job mainly. It wasn't my bulldozer, but it was mainly my job to drive it and keep the silage spread out and packed down. And uh, something apparently had happened to the dozer. And there's the trucks all waiting in line to dump. Because you couldn't dump too much in there at once because you couldn't pack it. But it's all waiting on the dozer to get packed going. They'd do, do that instead of having a silo? Well, that is a pit silo. Pit silo. They silo. still use them. You know, the big thing up north. They call them bunkers. Uh, they call them bunkers. Actually, uh, well, that's a big thing up north uh, is the... Uh, flat bunker silos um, the 
big uprights, they're pretty much a thing of the past because they acquire a lot of maintenance to keep them going. I mean, I ain't going to say they're not still used, but your bunker silos are more uh, modern to today's operation. And but, I noticed there wasn't a, a water a windmill. No. Was there ever one? Uh, no, it wouldn't been in need for one. Because the water, you couldn't already put it down on the creek because the trees would interfere with hair getting to that. Mm -hmm. And when you get away from the creek there, in other ways, well, there's no water. Right here where we're at, you would have to go 1,200 foot straight down to get water. And it would be artesian water. And a good chance it wouldn't taste good. Well, when, when they got the piece of property, they didn't have a choice of what, what piece they got. If it was a lottery, just whatever. I don't know that. I actually gone. don't know that. Um, I mean, it's not like doing the land one run, you go and stake claim. You pick, well, you I think it. here you maybe could ride out and look. And I guess the, they had a stake with the... Uh, uh, the way I legal. always thought it was, was your grandpa come up here and signed up, and he come out and picked, you out. picked yeah. out. His preference. His preference, okay. Then when his name or number was drawled, then he told him if it hadn't been chosen yet what he wanted. That makes sense. Is, and I'm thinking um, his sister, my aunt's got a book on all that. And it's got the listing of the names and the numbers. And uh, I think that 46, he was the 46th one drawn. Uh, the best of my knowledge. I wish we had that book where I could show you, but, um, uh, and I'm sh shocked that y'all might not have, think it would be in y'all's library. We'll have to look. Uh, could be there. Could be there. See, I, I never did understand the different times when these land runs or land was let out. And I was shocked to understand that this side of Highway 81, from there on, was Big Pasture. That wasn't part of Duncan. Right, right along the highway, of course it wasn't a highway then, but right there was a line that this was Oklahoma Territory and this was Oklahoma. Uh, you think the railroad probably divided it? Yeah, because well, it's, it's close See, to Duncan is so much older than Lawton uh, in time of being in existence. Uh, but, you know, mainly what made this part of the country to be known was Fort Sill. Because it was here back in the 1800s. Well, uh, earlier. Tell middle uh, them about Grandpa always seeing and talking to Geronimo. Well, I don't know that he talked to him. He didn't see him real often. Yes. Uh, he, we hardly ever get phone calls. <laughs> And normally, he got his cell phone and he'd be completely Hello. lost without it. But they weren't even answering. This, this is phone. his son, Greg. Geronimo? Yeah. Yeah. Some um, fam family lore there, then? Well, it was Geronimo himself. No. And I can't tell you whether it was before they locked him up out here. No, I don't. Right. That's kind of an odd it was probably thing happened. to have. He nearly always have uh, all right. a group of ladies with him, his wives, four or five, maybe six. And I think they would be walking and he'd be on his horse. And I don't know what direction they lived or anything. I was thinking about Geronimo town right down here, but I don't think that had anything to do with it. But... Um, I guess everybody was a little bit scared of him. You know, I don't think he approached him and went to talking to him. I'm sure there was a few of the um, what, city fathers or something that would or did. But anytime there was like a holiday or anything, he would come to Lawton and be seen. Now, he was pretty tamed. Oh yeah, but then after they yeah. locked him up and Drug him around and so on. 
Uh, there's a, I had a, I thought I had a picture of him, but there was a lot of pictures of him, though. But there's been a lot of controversy about where he's buried and where he should be buried. He's, he's out here. Yeah. And I think it's uh, his uh, descendants that's out in uh, New Mexico I think is right. wanting him out there. But, I mean, why bother a grave that's been in existence forever? The town's named after him and all. I get plug in right there. That's not bare wires you're showing, is it? No, it's a tape on okay. it. Okay. Well, all right. I think we've covered most of our questions. You used up your time anyway.